Welcome to our lecture online. And now let's talk about something that I think is extremely interesting in our galaxy, globular clusters. We've mentioned them before, but now we're going to talk about some of the details about globular clusters and why they are so unique in a way. First of all, global clusters are not confined to the disk and the bulge of the galaxy alone. They basically form a like a swarm of bees around the galaxy, a spherical region that reaches to the far end of the disk and goes about the same distance in the north-south direction, if you want to call that the north-south direction. They are concentrated towards the center, so you find more of them towards the center and fewer of them, fewer of them as you go further out, but they still do form that spherical region. So what's so special about those global clusters? Well, for one thing, they kind of follow their own path. All the stars in the galaxy, the nebulas, they tend to rotate around the center or revolve around the center of the galaxy. So the whole galaxy seems to move in a particular direction. Not, of course, all of the stars and all the, all the nebulas at the same rate. And that's why we have differentiation in the densities and we have the spiral arms formed from that. But the global clusters, they go just every which direction. They're completely independent on each one of them following its own path in different directions. So even though they stay in that spherical confine and they do revolve around the center of the galaxy, they tend to go in all kinds of different directions. On top of that, the stars within each cluster does the same thing. The whole cluster doesn't rotate or all the stars don't go around the same center of the cluster. Again, all the stars in the cluster tend to go their own separate direction. And yes, collisions do occur because those stars tend to be fairly close together. So here we have some beautiful pictures. Notice we have four global clusters right here. They're listed as M4 on the left. M80 is the second one. Here's 47 Tucani, one of the largest clusters in our galaxy. And then we have Omega Centauri, which is the absolute largest galaxy, uh, not galaxy, but global cluster in our galaxy. Notice that Omega Centauri, I don't know if you can see it, yeah, I think you can see the angle, it's got over 10 million stars in that singular cluster. Now, 47 Tucani has over a million stars, and each of these two global clusters are well over 100,000 stars clustered together. So these are enormous conglomerates, uh, concentrations of stars. Now, here we have some separate pictures. This here is a picture that zooms into the very center of that global cluster to give you an idea how densely populated those clusters are at the center, how close those stars are to one another. Here we have another picture to the center of NGC 6397. And so what's unique about that one is if you look carefully, and I don't know if you can see it on the camera, but there's actually some blue stars in there. Now blue stars, of course, are the OB type stars. They don't live very long. And the stars in the clusters tend to be very old. So you, see, you sit there and go, well, how can there be a blue star within a cluster if those clusters were formed billions of years ago? And it turns out those blue stars are actually the result of two stars colliding with one another, therefore forming a more massive star, kind of restarting the process in, on the main sequence. Well, not really restarting per se, but restarting as a new type of star. So instead of perhaps two uh, K-type stars colliding with each other, or maybe a third one colliding with the other two and so forth, building up a star large enough to become a O or a B type star and therefore becoming a blue star with much higher surface temperatures and much higher nuclear fusion rates at the center. So let's now look at some of the particular properties of these global clusters. So there are about 150 global clusters in our galaxy. We say about because we can't see them all. Some of them are simply hidden behind just large quantities of dust and gas, and we just can't get to some of the parts in our galaxy to see what exactly is there. But we estimate, based upon the, the, the ones that we can see, there must be about 150. I've seen estimates as high as 200 global clusters in our galaxy. The age of them are all roughly between 10 and 12 billion years old, which goes way to the beginning of the formation of the galaxy. So some of them are only maybe a billion years older than the galaxy itself. And so because of that, we know that those were formed by the, in the very beginning of the formation of the galaxy, when the galaxy was a lot smaller, everything was a lot closer and more dense together. And we know that global clusters have to form in very dense regions because of that, we figured that that's probably why they were formed so long ago when everything was much more dense than it is today. 
So the age of, of these global clusters, typically between 10 and 12 billion years old, and the way that we know how old these clusters are is by looking at the HR diagram and looking at the turnoff point. So this point right here, notice there's no stars on the remainder of the main sequence, and those stars right there at the very end, very top portion of the main sequence where they turn off to become red giants, those are the uh, stars equivalent to the age of the cluster. So those stars will stay on the main sequence for about 10, 12 billion years. So that's not that far from where our sun would be on the HR diagram. We see the turnoff point just below where the sun would be. So that's where these clusters are estimated to be 10 to 12 billion years old. Now, few are located in the galactic disk themselves. There are some, but they're just on the way through the disk. They don't particularly stay in the disk. They kind of move through the disk from bottom to top, top to bottom at different angles. Very few would actually travel inside the disk like the rest of the stars and the nebulas and the galaxies. So they really are on a path of their own. They tend to be more concentrated in the center and become less prevalent as you go further out from the center. The average luminosity, L stands for luminosity, is about equivalent to about 25,000 times the luminosity of the sun. Now, when you have a global cluster that has 100,000 stars, you say, well, why is it on only 25 times the luminosity of the sun? That's because the luminosity of the average star in those global clusters, since they're pretty old, they're smaller stars than the sun, so they're not as bright as the sun. So 100,000, 100,000 plus stars would have the equivalent luminosity of about 25,000 suns, and that's why that's the typical luminosity of a global cluster. The highest luminosity, of course, would come from Omega Centauri, which has over 10 million stars, and the luminosity there is well over 1 million times the luminosity of the Sun. Diameter-wise, they vary from about 10 light years across to 300 light years across. 300 light years across would be Omega Centauri. It's an absolute enormous monster, extremely large, but most global clusters are more in the area of 10 to 50 to 100 light years across. The highest density, at the very center of the most dense global clusters, we see densities where you have as many as 25 stars per cubic light year, which is absolutely enormous because typically the density of the stars around where we live is maybe 150 light years for a single star. So there would be 25 stars, hmm, 25 times 140, that's about 4,000 4, times the density that we're experiencing right here. So when you walk outside at night, on a clear night, in a dark area, you see all the stars in the sky. Imagine seeing 4,000 times as many stars in the sky. That's what it would be to be at the center of one of those global clusters. So they're extremely dense. The average density, you can see, of course, that the center is extremely dense. As you go further out, they're not nearly as dense. So you want to take the overall average of the volume of a global cluster, where you take the not-so-dense region compare and together with the dense regions, you have an, an average density of about one star for every 10 cubic light years, which is still about 15 times as dense as the stars that we have around us here. The typical mass of a star, as mentioned before, is about 0.8 times the mass of the sun or less. That's because those are the only stars that are left on the main sequence. All the other stars have become red giants and become white dwarfs, so they're no longer in existence. So mostly you'll find K and M type stars, the orangey, reddish type of stars. They're relatively small in size. As mentioned before, the motion of the stars is completely random, and because of that, there are indeed collisions. They are kind of close together towards the center. They do collide, and as they collide, they could then turn into new types of stars, like blue, large blue stars. And the motions of the clusters, again, are completely random. It's almost like when the cluster was formed at the very beginning of the formation of the galaxy, as the galaxy collapsed because of its rapid rotation, and so it would collapse into the pancake shape because of the centripetal forces, the global clusters did not seem to be part of that original formation of the galaxy and just kind of floated around the galaxy kind of the way the Oort cloud is a spherical region around the solar system. It didn't collapse into a region uh, where, where they are uh, kind of tied to the, to, the, to the revolutions of the planets around the sun. Just like the comets come in from all different directions, global clusters kind of do the same thing. Global clusters exhibit slow rotation. Another thing that's strange is that they have very slow rotation. That's probably part of the reason why they're not part of that galactic disk. 
So they rotate extremely slow on their axis with speeds of about 5 to 10 kilometers per second. That's even slower than most of the planets in our solar system. So there's not a lot of rotational motion within the global clusters. Yes, they were formed in very high density regions. And one example of that is not too far from here. Well, relatively speaking, about 50, 60 million light years from us, there is this huge region where there's about 2,500 galaxies clustered together. It's known as the Virgo Cluster. It's one of the most dense cl uh, galaxy cluster regions in our local area. And there we find a lot of global... Uh, uh, did I say global clusters? Hmm, I'm confusing this a little bit. Let me back up again. So what I was saying is that in that region, we have about 2,500 galaxies very tightly clustered together. So we know that since there's so many galaxies that form in that particular region, we would expect to also find a lot of global clusters in that region, and that's indeed the case. And one of the galaxies in the Virgo cluster, M87, that humongous uh, spherical or elliptical galaxy, has about 12,000 global clusters compared to about 150 for our galaxy, 12,000, that's about, it's almost 100 times as many clusters within that one galaxy, again, probably because that particular area of the universe and happens to be extremely dense, a lot of galaxies packed together, probably because there was a lot of material packed together in that region, and also as a place where a lot of global clusters were formed. So the global clusters were typically regions in very dense cloud and dust formations that just massively produced stars at a very rapid pace, all about at the same time, and that's why most of the stars within a global cluster are all at about the same age. And so that's probably what happened a long time ago when the galaxy was very dense and very tightly uh, put together before it expanded to the size that it was today. That's when most of those clusters were formed. And so they are indeed kind of a breed on their own. And that is, that's the story about global clusters. When you were talking about the Virgo cluster, mm -hmm. are you talking about like galaxies? When I was talking about the Virgo Cluster, the Virgo Cluster is a cluster of galaxies. That's right. So this is a very famous cluster that's about 60 light years away that has an enormous gravitational influence in the region around it. There's actually galaxies being pulled into that cluster region because there's so many galaxies clustered together. And also in that galaxy cluster region, you also find a lot of global clusters as well. Yeah, I know the word cluster applies to global clusters as well as to clusters of galaxies. Yeah, that's a little confusing. <laughs> it is. <laughs> so you're talking about um, the Milky Way um, global clusters. And could there, when, when they collide, do they make new stars? You said they make new stars, right? So the clusters themselves do not collide, oh, right? Inside the clusters. So, so, but inside the clusters, the stars are so tightly packed, they're so close together, and they have random motion. So chances are, at random, that once in a while, the two will collide. And when they collide, they'll form a single star with all that mass of the two stars put together. Perhaps a third one and maybe even a fourth one will collide with that and eventually they'll become so large they actually turn into O and B type stars. So they turn into blue stars. And then of course the extra mass causes extra pressure which causes extra temperature which causes much more faster fusion reaction. And so you can, I, can, I can see it on the picture. I don't know if the camera can see it. There's actually blue stars within that cluster which are a result of those collisions. But, um No, no, there's, there's nothing else besides stars in those clusters. Uh, those clusters are so tightly packed that any nebulas or any other material would have gravitationally been pulled into the stars uh, with the random motion. They kind of sweep the region clean in just a bunch of stars. So it's not like they could form a new solar system by uh, mm. things colliding together mm -hmm. and get attracted into a star that was just formed? Not, not a chance. You would think that even if planets were formed, they would have been swallowed up by the stars moving in all different directions for the last 10, 12 billion years. So it's, it's fairly, it's pretty well a clean region with nothing but stars there. You wouldn't expect planets or nebulas or anything else to be there. Even on the outside, 
further outside of the cluster? That's actually a good question. So obviously when you go much further out where the density is much less, the potential there would be for nebulas that have formed planetary objects, yeah. Hmm? So maybe a solar system? Yeah, and you know what? It would be quite interesting to live on a planet around one of those stars and look up and see that enormous cluster there. That would be quite a sight. Jealous? Yeah. I wish I could see one <laughs> like that. <laughs> that would be an enormous. Now, some of the clusters are actually close enough to us to have the size of about a full moon. It's just that they're so dim that we can typically not see them with, with the naked eye and you have to uh, use a telescope to see them. There's only a couple of clusters you can barely see, just really fuzzy with the naked eye, but you can't really make it out. They almost look like a little star, like a fuzzy star rather than a cluster.